Good afternoon, and welcome to the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research's webinar on how to write a winning proposal for FSR's fellowship program. I'm Mary McGowan, CEO of FSR. FSR is the leading international nonprofit association committed to accelerating research in sarcoidosis, providing education and support to those living with sarcoidosis and their care partners, and raising awareness about sarcoidosis worldwide. We are thrilled to be joined today by those of you who share our passion in searching for better treatment and cures for sarcoidosis. Just a quick bit of housekeeping, your phone will be muted. However, we would like to encourage you to ask questions. There is a chat box located in the bottom of your screen. Type your questions into this box throughout the presentation. We will have a question and answer period at the end of this call. This webinar will be recorded and will live on our website. The Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research would like to thank Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals for providing the generous support to make this fellowship possible. Next slide, please. FSR was founded over 20 years ago by a woman living with sarcoidosis and her husband. Since that time, FSR has provided over $5 million in support of sarcoidosis research. FSR has over 50,000 members in our community. Next slide, please. FSR has a four-pronged approach. First, we work to advance and accelerate research in sarcoidosis. FSR has a robust fellowship and grant program to support researchers in the sarcoidosis space. In addition, through FSR's SARC Connect program, FSR works with academic and industry partners to identify willing clinical trial participants and to ensure that all research remains patient-centered. FSR also provides those living with sarcoidosis numerous support opportunities, including wellness programming, social events with others who have similar lived experiences and one-on-one -on -one support through our patient navigator program. Additionally, FSR is committed to providing educational opportunities for patients and clinicians in order to provide them with the most up-to-date research and clinical care information in sarcoidosis. And finally, FSR advocates for researchers and clinicians and those living with sarcoidosis by encouraging more funding for sarcoidosis research and working to reduce access challenges. Next slide. FSR is proud to work with our esteemed scientific advisory board composed of world-renowned key opinion leaders within the fields of sarcoidosis, medical research, therapy development, and medical practice. It is now my pleasure to introduce the chair of FSR scientific advisory board, Dr. Elliot Krauser. Dr. Krauser has over 31 years of medical experience and has been a member of FSR's SAB since 2016. He is a professor of medicine at Ohio State University, where he specializes in pulmonary and critical care medicine with a focus on translational research on systemic, on systemic inflammatory diseases involving the lungs. In 25 years of supported research, Dr. Krauser's laboratory has contributed to the publication of more than 100 peer-reviewed manuscripts, including the first efforts to study sarcoidosis disease mechanisms by deeply scrutinizing genetic data and the first clinical practice guidelines for sarcoidosis, which were endorsed by the American Thoracic Society in 2020. In addition to his research, Dr. Krauser served as the president of the American Association of Sarcoidosis and Other Granulomatous Disorders from 2017 to 2019 and has advocated for the sarcoidosis community through engagement with the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Krauser, we are honored to have you with us here today. Thank you so much and I'll pass the baton over to you. Well, thank you, uh, Mary, for that very nice introduction. And uh, with that, I'm really excited to tell you all about this new funding me mechanism that is targeted towards uh, early stage investigators. Since FSR fellowship grants were first offered in 2018, a total of 1.25 million uh, in, in, uh, grants have been awarded to five fellows. So uh, 
quite an accomplishment in a very short period of time. Next slide. Uh, this year, the FSR is, is planning to support a two-year fellowship grant at $75,000 per year, which is substantial, uh, and it is for two years, a total of $150,000. Uh, we'd also like to acknowledge again that Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals has generously supported this grant funding mechanism. The objectives of the, of the two-year fellowship is to fundamentally provide an early opportunity for you to develop the skills you will need to become a successful researcher. So you need to have the proper mentorship and a good plan in place and the infrastructure to support you. And of course, you're gonna need time committed to do that. So that's part of the, the, um, the goal of this uh, funding mechanism is to give you that time to get you started such that you are kind of uh, committed to sticking with sarcoidosis and you have some preliminary data to carry forward. Next slide. The logistics are simple. Uh, just like most funding mechanisms, uh, the grant support will come to your institution. And the idea is that your institution would then provide in turn support for you so that you have the time to de get dedicate to the projects that you're proposing. And we're asking for a significant amount of your uh, time and dedication, uh, but it can be distributed over clinical and also research so that it's just not all in the lab, for instance. There are two basic types of applications. Uh, the first type, type one, is uh, the typical funding mechanism that we normally uh, would be um, uh, involved with. That is the fellowship applicant, we design a study uh, with them and they submit the grant and the research plan and the training grant uh, plan, et cetera. There's also a type two application type, which is an interesting one from my perspective, where the mentor actually comes up with a research plan and then they go and they get this, you know, this grant funded. And then you find the mentor or the mentee, that is the trainee, the fellow that would fit with that project. So I think that's, a, that's an interesting uh, new approach and um, we'll see how that goes. The eligibility criteria, well, fundamentally, you have to be at an early stage of your career, and you, you have to identify a, a study that is innovative in the field. It can't be a redo of something. And also, it should be uh, something that if you did complete the project, you would learn a lot from it and gain a lot of skills that would be useful going forward. The first year of the project is really more of a hands-on year. So this could be a more clinical uh, experiential year where you get to know the ins and outs of taking care of sarcoidosis patients, what are the challenges, and, um, and, and what are the uh, needed skills to, to optimally take care of those patients. The second year should then transition towards a research project, whether that's a clinical research project or a basic science uh, kind of uh, project, that can be up to you. Uh, the, ultimately, it's upon you, just like any other training grant, such as you would uh, submit to the NIH, uh, you have to come up with a, uh, a, a training goal, uh, including a long-term uh, plan to stick with sarcoidosis research and clinical care in your career. Um, and you also have to provide a plan for your self-training. That is, uh, um, you might have to do some biostatistical work or some other didactics to help augment your skills such that you're ready to pursue a, an, a, an academic career in sarcoidosis, which is the, the ultimate goal. Uh, one, I'll just go one more uh, comment about that last slide. Uh, you should, uh, you're, it, part of the application process is to provide a detailed budget, and we're going to get into a little bit more of the details of the of the application uh, in, a, in a, uh, a future slide, but I wanted to draw attention to the website, the FSR website, www.stopsarcoidosis.org, which will have more details on what is expected of you as you're applying for this grant. So the allowable costs, um, you're not allowed uh, to uh, request indirect costs. This is something, if you're not familiar with this concept, uh, many academic institutions ask for a, 
an additional amount of money to support the infrastructure of the uh, research uh, uh, program at their institution. That can be as much as 50 to 100% extra money uh, that this, this particular grant will not provide. So the money from this grant goes directly to the, the fellow who is in training. And also it may go for travel that they may need for to go present their work at a, a, a national or international meeting or materials and supplies that you might need to do your research in that second year. Uh, the following criteria are used as we evaluate each grant application. First of all, is the applicant uh, you know, eligible? Uh, so make sure you're eligible. You shouldn't be a, a senior investigator. Uh, is this for an early stage investigator, a fellow, or perhaps even a, an early uh, uh, faculty career position uh, where you're trying to gain the skills required to, uh, to uh, consolidate your career. We also look at the mentor. Have they mentored others before successfully? Are they in a position uh, with a, in a, enough support to provide uh, support to the project? Uh, the research training plan I alluded to earlier, if you need to learn some other skills like biostatistics or genomics or whatever it might be, uh, put that into your research training plan and that will augment your, your application success. Uh, we need to know that you're ultimately, when you put this package together, that you're likely to gain a lot of um, a meaningful training that will allow you to succeed at the next stages of your career. Uh, finally, you should be at an institution that has the environment and the commitment to you. Uh, so for instance, they would, it would be a good idea for you to get from your division director or your department chair, a letter saying, yep, I support you in your uh, endeavor to become a sarcoidosis researcher uh, through the FSR a fellowship me mechanism. And I'm, I'm offering you, you know, release time adequate to, pr to, the to perform the proposed research. And then the budget would also connect with, uh, the budget should be dedicated towards releasing your, your time so that you can devote it to the, to the project. And then finally, of course, the proposal should be important uh, in some way or another. You should be addressing an important need or at least an important research avenue that will in the long term pay off uh, for you academically and for sarcoidosis patients in the long run as well. Reporting requirements are pretty straightforward. We have biannual scientific reports where you just update us on how things are going, what you have learned, uh, and any kind of objective success or progress. There's a financial report uh, biannually, basically how you spent the money. Hopefully you're spending it mostly on your salary, but also on lab supplies and travel. And then finally, at the end of the whole thing, we would expect you uh, to present your research uh, to a forum of, of the fellows and uh, others that would be uh, interested in your work. And um, that's a, a good, uh, place to kind of reassess your your position and actually you, at this point in your uh, in the second year you should be thinking about the next steps in the evolution of your academic uh, 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 academic uh, career which might be putting in another grant a bigger uh, 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 an extended grant series to take you to the next level and uh, we would uh, like to help you with in that step and with that, um, I'd like to just uh, uh, tell you that the deadline is coming up for uh, this year's application. It's on February 26th. Um, the review will be done uh, between February and April 30th. And the decision notification will be provided in May. Uh, in June, the agreements will be made with your institution and um, by uh, the end of June of 2023, uh, that you should have completed the the the, pro the, the uh, fellowship and be ready to provide that final um, report. And with that, I will hand off to Trisha, who's going to introduce uh, our our recent uh, successes in the fellowship uh, program. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Krauser. That was extremely informative. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Erica Hersog and Dr. Chang Wan Ru. Dr. Ru and Dr. Hersog will provide you tips and tricks on how to write a successful proposal um, for previously, and they are previously funded in this area. Dr. Hersog is a professor of medicine and pathology at Yale School of Medicine, where she serves as the Associate Dean of Student Research and Director of the Yale ILD Center of Excellence. She is an NIH funded award-winning physician and scientist who has published extensively in the fields of interstitial lung disease and sarcoidosis. She is dedicated to cultivating the next generation of biomedical researchers and has mentored numerous individuals at all stages of training. Dr. Herzog is also a past recipi recipient of FSR funding. Dr. Ru is an assistant professor of medicine in the section of pulmonology, critical care, and sleep medicine at Yale. He received a BS at Emory and an MPH at Dartmouth College and an MD from New York Medical College. After completing his internal medical residency, including a year as chief resident at SUNY Upstate Medical University, he became a Yale, he, he came to Yale for his pulmonary critical fellowship. Dr. Rue is a recipient of the 2018 FSR Sarcoidosis Fellowship. During his time as a clinical fellow, he joined the laboratory of Dr. Erica Herzog, and under her mentorship, he conducted translational research in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and sarcoidosis. His research involves the, clinical, the, the study of clinical phenotypes in sarcoidosis. Related to this, he is exploring the pathogenic mechanisms by which mitochondrial DNA contributes to the disease pathology in interstitial lung disease. Dr. Rue and Dr. Hersog, if you would like to begin. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I will uh, start and Dr. Herzog will uh, kind of add in her perspective at the mentor level uh, at every uh, step of the way. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, first we'll start reviewing the uh, elements of our FSR application. Uh, first, uh, the signs. So we had previously found that elevated concentrations of mitochondrial DNA in the circulation was associated with poor outcomes in IPF through its interactions with toll-like receptor 9. And so we then asked the question of whether mitochondrial DNA uh, was associated with clinical outcomes in sarcoidosis, which has previously been shown to be associated with differential expression of TLR9. And so we, I was lucky to have access to two independent sarcoidosis cohorts to conduct this study. We had a local cohort of sarcoidosis subjects from Yale, approximately, uh, 20, approximately 25 or so. And then we had access to the GRADS cohort. The GRADS cohort was a cross-sectional study conducted from 2013 to 2015. And we had access to about 300 plasma samples. And what we found was that in both sarcoidosis cohorts, plasma concentrations of mitochondrial DNA were significantly elevated relative to controls. More excitingly, we found that plasma from African-American patients with sarcoidosis had higher plasma mitochondrial DNA concentrations than their uh, Caucasian counterparts. And so when we put this, uh, when we put this to get the story together, we found that uh, high plasma, high concentrations of plasma mitochondrial DNA and African-American race would, uh, led to higher odds of having extrapulmonary uh, sarcoidosis, which is associated with poor, uh, which is associated with poor outcomes in sarcoidosis. Next slide. So that led to the hypo our hypothesis of the, of our FSR application, where we hypothesize that racially disparate outcomes uh, seen between African-American and Caucasian uh, patients with sarcoidosis are driven by and reflected by high by circulating, circulating levels of mitochondrial DNA. So our first aim was to compare the nature of the circulating mitochondrial DNA between African-American and Caucasian patients with sarcoidosis. Our second aim was to determine the role of mitochondrial DNA in TLR9 activation. And so the, real, the innovation behind this was to elucidate the, bi, uh, the, bio, uh, the biologic significance of mitochondrial DNA and TLR9 interactions to characterize 
uh, the clinical outcome disparities between African American and Caucasian patients with sarcoidosis. And our ultimate uh, goal would be then to characterize these mitochondrial DNA TLR9 activation uh, interactions to leverage this understanding uh, to develop novel TLR9 targeted therapies for sarcoidosis. Now, Eric, now Dr. Herzog is going to give her perspective on this. Okay, thank you. So, I, I think when you're when you have a fellow come in and has uh, an interest in a disease that you yourself have interest in, it's really important that they have a project that has a, a pretty high likelihood of success and also one that will be able to serve as their own independent career. And so what I mean by that is with this project, he just summed up about what, four or five years of work in two slides. And he kind of breezed over the fact that we had access to two cohorts, that we had significant local expertise in mitochondrial DNA and TLR9, that we had all of the, the recipe for this grant working since everything was in place already that needed to be there in order for the grant to succeed. So what I mean by that is he didn't have to go find the cohort. We already had it in the freezer. He didn't have to go start a whole new biology. We already had it working in the lab for a different project. And so that's, that's what we talk about, high likelihood of success and feasibility. Then when we talk about independence, the whole goal of a mentored career award is so the mentee can at the end have a project that and, and a data set and a body of work that will serve as the basis for their own career moving forward. And as a mentor, that means you have to be prepared to give up the project to the mentee. And that can be difficult because if the mentee makes a groundbreaking discovery with something that was that kind of came out of your lab, you still have to be ready to give it up, even though you, you may secretly want, want to, to take it back. Um, so, so when Wani came up with this project, it was very important that both of those criteria be met. And then additionally, thinking about a project that is going to have longevity for the mentee and will, will be exciting to the mentee, that will inspire their intellectual curiosity and excitement. Because as you all know, all the attendees on this call know that working in the lab and doing research is a 24 seven job. You work all day long seeing your patients and then you come home and maybe at night or on the weekends is when you're able to, to be doing your, your science. So when you're writing a grant to get significant protected time, that's all, obviously a very important component, but there has to be that fire of imagination and creativity that will contribute to this project being something exciting moving forward and that will um, keep, keep the intellectual engagement going. So that is my mentor philosophy. I'm gonna mute myself and then turn it back over to Wani. All right, thank you. Um, so now, next, I want to discuss a little bit about the uh, career development plan and el other elements, the non-science elements of the grant. Uh, so first, uh, as Dr. Krauser also alluded to earlier, the career development plan is probably uh, one of the most, if not the most important aspect of the uh, grant application. And so most career development plans, uh, from what I've seen and what we've written involves uh, some degree of coursework, like Dr. Krauser said, you're trying to acquire and develop new skills. And these skills really should augment the informal learning that you get from day-to-day -day, uh, activities of just being in the lab. Uh, a lot of stuff in the lab and on research is self-driven uh, self and you're kind of learning um, like just going online, uh, watching, you know, watching videos, people performing different experiments or 
going online to look at how to analyze some data sets. And so for me, the coursework that I really wanted to explore is to le learn how to code in R um, and really tr try to do the things that where formal learning would just make, make, make it easier for you. Uh, conference attendance is, is key. Um, ATS is a big one, but also WASAG. Hopefully we'll be able to have this uh, conference in person this coming, uh, this coming summer. Um, administrative and leadership roles. And one of the things that uh, I've been able to do uh, is take more part in, into our translational research program. Uh, Dr. Herzog is the founder of our, um, of our bio repository. And now um, as she moves transitions into other roles, I've been kind of taking a more uh, vocal uh, leadership role in this program. And in general, you should be looking for things that you can uh, you can have in, within your own program where there's opportunities for uh, leadership. Um, the research advisory committee, uh, obviously your primary mentor, I'll get to a little bit more uh, uh, in, in the next slide, but uh, one of the things that I've uh, that I would highlight is, uh, is, is your primary mentor, someone A, that you can get along with well and that you click together. Uh, that's huge, uh, obviously, because you spend uh, a, a ton of time working with each other and just in constant communication. That's part of that 24-7 uh, uh, element that uh, uh, comes, into, comes into play and making sure that your mentor is available to you uh, to answer all your questions because again, you know, research is a constantly evolving process and you want to have that type of relationship. Uh, the other thing too that I was just thinking, especially with this uh, sarcoidosis project too, is just the local expertise in the lab that I'll have people whom I can ask to uh, help with certain uh, uh, with certain uh, lab techniques and also people who I can ask to help analyze data. And then also to just to have an extra pair of hands. Um, you know, with this grads project, we actually ended up having to run over a thousand samples. And so we had, uh, any, we had residents, med students, grad, uh, grad students, undergrads, all kind of help participate. And that all stems from having a, a, a mentor who's well-connected and well-known in, in, uh, in, in our institution. Um, and then advisors, Having advisors that can really add some complementary expertise to your advisor and uh, to your mentor, and so you had people who who are familiar with the, who are familiar with things that your mentor may not be that can really help you with your really help you uh, get your project uh, underway. And then lastly, with uh, don't forget about the clinical activities. Again, seventy five percent of your time should be devoted to research uh, and career development activities, but that twenty five percent of clinical service time really needs to be um, targeted to advancing your career. And so, you know, if you're going down this path of doing sarcoidosis research, yeah, you may not be some ICU guy who takes care, who takes care of ECMO patients for severe a ARDS, but you are gonna use that 25% clinical service time to develop real expertise and understanding and caring uh, for these patients with sarcoidosis. Next slide. And so the application, again, the mentor, um, you want to have someone who you already, who you are establishing a relationship with. And so uh, your mentor should really be familiar with your strengths and weaknesses. And so that your mentor won't ask you to do things that um, are completely out of your realm, uh, are so outside your strengths that it ends up just hurting uh, the, uh, hurting the process, hurting your, uh, research progress. Um, just being able to, just having completed research projects and understanding how each person uh, works. You know, Dr. Herzog and I, I think, um, like to start early, um, don't really, uh, like, yeah, we like to start things early and we, I think, start to develop a, a, a workflow uh, that, that complements each other best. And then writing papers, uh, again, making sure you can write, uh, your writing styles are similar and that, you, you know, you, we go back and forth all the time. Uh, we go back and whenever we're writing a paper, um, you know, there's a lot of back and forth, a lot of revisions uh, that, that, come between, uh, that come between us. And so having, having that writing relationship is probably just as important as anything else. Um, institutional support, kind of talk to make sure that there's the research infrastructure there 
uh, with the local expertise and resources so that uh, you can complete the complete the complete your aims so that uh, the tech the new technologies that are that are that you're writing about in your grant have to be available at your in your institution as well as the expertise to help troubleshoot and finalize uh, your data. Um, and then also the clinical expectations that yes, you're not going to be someone that's going to be there, uh, be able to uh, be there on clinical service all the time. And in fact, you're very, your clinical service time is actually uh, quite limited. Um, as an applicant, is this an area of, is this topic of interest to you? And you really have to be honest with yourself. Um, do you really, is this what you want to do? Um, and like, is this thing, is this topic of significant interest to you? Is this the road that you want to go down? Because you're making a commitment uh, to become a physician scientist. And there's a lot of time, attention, and resources going to be going towards this, not only between your mentor and your institution. And so this is something that you really have to, uh, you have to really be dedicated and committed to. And I think it shows when you uh, put this application together what you, you know what your uh, what your interest level is, and then uh, in your application the project um, what you make sure you have good preliminary data and a plan and a feasible plan for uh, being able to move this uh, move your project forward. Next slide. Okay, so looking at. So looking at a mentored career award from the mentor perspective, it's when you as the mentor are signing up for something like this, you're realizing and you're committing that it's going to be a, a significant amount of time in reading and reviewing the grant. And it's pretty important for the mentee to also realize that the mentor will benefit that the best grant will come from having a lot of input from your mentor and that can't be achieved by sending the grant to your mentor the day before it's due. I mean this is really you have to start quite early to get going um, with the with the grants and um, get a product that is going to read well and be clear and be feasible and really speak to the review committee. The mentor also is going to need to provide funding for all costs not covered by the funding agency. And so for a mentored career award, usually what you're getting is a salary support and a small amount of funds for um, experiments. And so the mentor needs to realize that they're going to be committing large amounts of funding um, for a project that will ultimately become their mentee's career. And the mentor has to be okay with that. That kind of gets back to the, the, um, the tension that I mentioned early on about the mentor needs to be ready to relinquish the project at the end and, and actually state that in their, their letter of support. Um, and as I said, the, so the mentor really needs to be prepared that this, is, this project will become the mentee's. And it's also important for the mentor, in addition to what we talked about before with giving the, um, the project and the intellectual guidance and uh, the time, the frequent interactions, the mentor also needs to help the mentee make connections on the national stage because for some grant funding mechanisms, external letters um, from referees are required. And the only way the mentee can get those letters is if the, the mentee has been um, getting visibility at the national level. And so ways that this can happen is at ATS, um, for, so for sarcoidosis, you know, at WASOG, um, when visiting lecturers come, the mentor needs to go out of the way to include the mentee in meetings and dinners, other, other types of forums. All of that can be really important because, you know, at the at the end of this grant, let's say you are successful in, in getting the FSR grant, the next step will be a K award. And for the K award, three letters of external reference are required. And if 
we don't think strategically several years in advance for how those letters are going to be obtained. When it comes time for the application, you're going to be scrambling and it's going to be pretty clear to the reviewers that the um, th that it was that the, the strength of those evaluations isn't as good as they could be. So I'll stop and um, turn it back over to Wani. All right, so here's some uh, grant writing uh, perspective, uh, perspectives from the, the mentee side. So everyone will tell you to start early and I definitely recommend starting early if that works for you. Uh, the main thing though, is that your mentor and your collaborator's time is significantly um, less open than your time. And so you have to give them uh, enough time to look things over. Um, so I generally like to start early, but I know of some of my other colleagues who they thrive under that deadline and need that pressure. But you got to keep your mentor and your clock, your mentor, specifically your mentor's time in mind when, when you're uh, starting these grants. The other thing too is, the other caveat is that these grants are never as easy as they look. Um, even a short grant like the FSR grant, you know, when even though uh, I, I can't remember, and I remember when we did it, the page limit was something like, uh, three pages long. Um, the real estate on that uh, page goes by real fast and it ended up being a lot harder than we anticipated. We're asking, oh, do we really need that figure? And so you got to, these grants are never as easy as they seem and always plan, uh, build that in. Look at other grants, uh, especially your, men old, your mentor's old grants and other people's at your institution, just to see what the writing and what the writing is like and just what an old what a grant is supposed to look like. Um, all those review papers and book chapters that you were tasked to write and maybe weren't quite so enthused about doing, that's really uh, the, the, the introductory uh, statements and uh, foundation for these grants. And so when you're writing a review or a book chapter, it should really be uh, the planning stages for a future grant. Um, you want to create some writing momentum and so write the sections that are the easiest and the most knowledgeable uh like pick the aim that you know quote unquote writes itself start with that aim and then once you have some stuff written on the page uh it tends to flow a little bit later uh flow a little bit easier and then going back to starting early uh tell the mentor what that the deadline is a little earlier than it is we all play this game a little bit, you, you know, the foundation has their grant deadline, but then your grants department has their own deadline. And that grants department deadline tends to be a bit on a sliding scale and we, it's a soft deadline. And so you want to kind of use that to, you know, maybe, oh, you end up buying an extra day here or two uh, with, uh, with that. And, and it's all about just making sure that there's enough time to put this grant uh, together. And I'll stop and let Erica uh, give uh, talk about her, her perspective. Great, and I think we're pretty close to the end of our presentation and then it'll be open up for questions. So um, I think Wani is right about uh, the starting early. I think when you're reading, the when you're working on the grants and especially as a mentor, I'm always thinking both as a scientist and then as the potential reviewer. And I thought it would be important here to, inst to put in what some of the FSR review criteria are because that, that can save you a lot of trouble. Um, first of all, it's important to be sure that the application aligns with the stated goals of the grants. And so what, what, it mean, what I mean by that is if the grant's a career development award, but you don't put anything in about career development, then the grant is not really responsive to the funding opportunity and there's, there's going to be a disconnect and it probably won't be scored as well. So for example, the FSR criteria. So um, reviewers are going to on a, it's usually a one to nine um, NIH scale, I believe, or I guess the FSR scale. Um, they're, they're going to need to grade the applicant, mentor, training plan, training potential, and institutional environment and commitment. And so in terms of the applicant, they'll look at things like prior productivity as the greatest predictor of future success. 
for the mentor, they'll look at research area, they'll look at prior mentoring success, as well as funding, because the mentor is going to need to fund this project. The research training plan, and so this is where a mentored career award is different from an independent investigator award. And so sometimes people will get into trouble where they cut and paste from the mentor's RO1, and the grant isn't written so much about training as it is everything that you're going to do and discover. The, role, the, the goal of the FSR is to actually train you to do new research. And so that needs to be incorporated somehow in, and have a level of detail that's appropriate to a trainee. The training potential, and so that gets into the career development plan. And then the last part is the institutional environment and commitment. And that's where your institution is going to need to say they'll give you space, they're going to give you time, they may give you a faculty appointment, all things like that are, are going to be very important to reviewers as they're choosing between many qualified applicants, because what, what the reviewers are doing, they're tasked by the, the funding agency to choose the applications with the highest likelihood of the, of the mentee going on to be successful and becoming a physician scientist. Um, now notice again, very little of this refers to the actual science. And again, I would like to, I would like to reiterate, it's very clear to grant reviewers when you cut and paste it from your mentor's R01. So I remember with Wani's grant, um, Wani I think was, was uh, being, um, maybe a little more RO1-ish in his, in the voice of, in which the grant was being written. And so we, we, we did some work to change that, to make it more about what he was going to learn from the grant rather than what he was going to discover. And I think that that went over well. Next slide. Um, okay, Wani. Yeah. And so, yeah. Uh, foundations for future success. Again, start writing with your mentor early, uh, and and really, no, there's no publication too small. You know, the the first couple publications I had with Erica were actually two case reports and an editorial. So, but I think that kind of at least got got us started, and it just sort of showed what our expectations and writing styles were like. And so, you just want to start writing something early on, so you kind of know how each other works. And then collaborate with others when the opportunities arise. And you got to really be open to your role when you collaborate. You know, sometimes it could be something really exciting and really cool to do, like, you know, downloading and analyzing geodata off of PubMed. Or other times, you, you know, you're the only person who's able to uh, do the chart abstraction and get some raw data that way. But really just be open to it and so that you can see that this, so that you can find future collaborators. And then also the other opportunities for, pro for projects outside of your mentor. I mean, but doing this has really opened up for me to collaborate with some of my, our other faculty members, including this most recent project that I've been doing in sarcoidosis. And so really take advantage uh, of the collaborations that really uh, arise and uh, many will, uh, especially with a, with a great mentor like Erica. Okay, and then we'll just wrap this up so there's enough time. Um, so from my standpoint, the mentee needs to get as much research experience as possible and needs to network and needs to have research that exists outside of your lab that demonstrates that th that person is independent and distinct from you. I also enjoy learning from my mentees because I... Um, I, I tend to have fixed ideas and mentees are the future. They bring a lot of new methods and a lot of new perspectives into the lab. And so being able to have kind of bi-directional learning is, is really key in the relationship. One thing that can be challenging for the mentor is if you identify an area for where the mentee could improve, Sometimes it's difficult to provide explicit feedback and recommendations, but Wani and I at least once a year sit down and are pretty frank with each other about what's going well and what could be improved, um, how 
science and, and education are changing and how our relationship and our research program should adapt in response to that. So it's really great to have a mentee that you can kind of say, I think you need to change the direction you're going or, oh, you're, I didn't like that paragraph. Um, and in the same way, it's nice when your mentee can say, I really need this thing back. Can you please respond to my email? <laughs> Um, and of course, the goal of all this is that the mentee really needs to be able to embark upon their own career. And as I always say about my own mentor, who is Jack Elias, the, the most important Jack Elias, did, the most important thing that Jack Elias did for me was to prepare me for his absence when he left Yale. It was very scary. I mean, I was an associate, assistant associate professor, and I'd been working with him for 15 years, he, he left and I didn't know what would happen, but I had been really well prepared based on the mentoring. And so that's really what I need to impart to, to the next generation. Next slide. And then I think both of us would say that being a physician scientist is the most exciting and impactful job there is. And so in the end, it's all about having fun and making discovery. And if it's not fun, if it's torture, it's probably not the right job, but if you love it, then keep going. Thank you both for that presentation. I think that provided a lot of guidance to people who are looking to apply this year. Um, for those of you um, who are on the call, if you would like to ask a question, as a reminder, please type your question into the chat box, which is located at the bottom of your screen. I'll start with an um, uh, initial question uh, that we have here about any advice that you have, um, uh, Dr. Herzog, for the mentee to stay on track. Um, well, Wani is probably the most on track person I've ever met. So, so he, he may be more qualified to answer this. I, I would say from a mentor perspective, um, remaining focused when you're supposed to be in the lab, be in the lab, don't view the lab as the time when you can go do right heart casts or shadow in the echo lab or um, join the Yale biking team and decide that you're gonna try to be in the over 40 Olympics or something. I mean, these are all things that have happened with other mentees, not with Lonnie. So be focused, pr be prioritized, um, kind of commit to the science and that this is going to be your project. And when you, when you have ideas, which will obviously occur, kind of shelve them because you have such limited time and such limited resources. You, you need to put all of your effort into making your project work um, because otherwise it'll be too diffuse and, and it won't really get to the level it needs to for funding. Wani, would you add anything to that? Yeah, you know, one thing that uh, always kind of kept me a little honest was, um, uh, and I think mentors in general, being receptive to negative data or just negative findings. Um, you know, so I've shown you like PCRs that look completely abysmal and like things of that nature. And so, uh, but uh, working, uh, working with your trainees when, when there's like negative data, uh, receiving that as positively as positive data actually really goes a long way. Uh, because then uh, you just sort of that free flow of information, but also kind of keeps things keeps things moving uh, because things that will kind of drag out a project or just kind of kill the momentum is when things are not working, um, you know. And when when you do when you when you have a mentor that will kind of embrace the negative data or find negative data just as exciting as positive data, uh, then uh, that will actually really help because I, I would say that that ends up being, you know, when you have positive data that, you know, that speaks for itself, it gets the ball rolling it keeps everything moving forward. But it's just when the experiments stop working or the approach to your data analysis isn't uh, turning out the way you thought and you sort of, uh, that's sort of what kills the momentum. And so I think uh, just being open and embracing negative data to find a solution to work together actually helps a lot. 
Thank you. Um, and Dr. Krauser, a question for you with regard to people who are reviewing these. Can you say a little bit about what the review process is? Well, um, I can't say that I have a lot of experience myself with it because when I was uh, my own mentee uh, uh, applied, so I didn't uh, review the grants on the last cycle, but all the reviewers are fully qualified as having mentored other trainees have having received uh, these kind of grants earlier in their career. So we actually find people that would be of the same caliber as the ones that would review NIH grants. So I don't know if that uh, provides enough information, but the, the way we're reviewing the grants is similar in terms of the scale being used to assess the quality of the grants. And the process is very similar in terms of the the, the, um, the review process and the and the feedback provided to the um, to the trainees. And one other thing I would point out is there is no penalty for reapplying. Uh, and if you do reapply, just as you would for an NIH grant, I, I would advise you to to uh, address each and every comment made by the reviewer on the last cycle. If you didn't get the grant the first time, and you're reapplying, write down the the comments of the reviewer and tell them, the new reviewers, the next phase reviewers, how you've addressed every single comment and how much you appreciate those, those wise uh, comments. I would advise that, that you mentioned that too. Fantastic, thank you. And um, I'm gonna introduce really quickly uh, Tamara Al-Hakim. She is the research program manager here at FSR um, to answer the next question, um, which is I think about the logistics of applying. Um, so we received a question about trying to find specific guidelines on how to write the fellowship, formatting, um, et cetera. Could you speak to that, Tamara? Yeah, um, thank you so much for that question. Um, when you go on the FSR website, there should be a link that will direct you now to the um, NIH um, Early Career Investigator K Grant um, formatting guide. So that is the guideline that we are following um, closely for this fellowship grant. So be sure, you know, if you have any further questions about page limits or a specific section, do not hesitate to reach out to me. Um, my email is my first name, Tamara, at stopsorcoidosis.org. And I'm happy to answer any specific questions um, in terms of formatting, but we usually like to use the NIH guidelines um, closely to help with um, determining the format for these grants, just as a way to, you know, kind of expose the applicants to that kind of page limit, those kind of formatting issues, um, and, you know, just kind of make sure that you have that flow or that practice for when you do um, wish to apply to the NIH in the future for other grants. Okay. Thank you, Tamara. Um, so one of the next questions that we received, uh, and perhaps uh, Dr. Rue, you can speak to this, um, the experience that you have in reporting back to FSR, can you say a little bit more about um, your experience with that? Yeah, um, I guess in terms of like the uh, progress reports or stuff like, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that's the other part of it too, of, um, um, of staying on track and staying focused is, uh, you know, we we have to uh, submit these quarterly or biannual. I can't remember. Uh, at least a biannual, couple. Biannual. Yeah, biannual uh, progress reports. And uh, yeah, we don't want. I don't want to submit the same one. And I'd like to make. Uh, you know, we, it does kind of keep you honest as well in terms of like deadlines and things like that. I've definitely. Um, you know, push some experiments forward uh, just to have a last a little bit of extra data with every progress report. Uh, mainly because you know th those progress reports, you know, that should be building your building up to your next publication or to your next grant. And so um, it does help that these uh, progress. Uh, I view these progress reports as a way of a kind of somewhat writing your next paper or writing your next credit. It's definitely the foundation for it. Okay, thank you. Um, so if there are no other questions, um, we will move on to close out the webinar. So I'm just gonna give a second. Okay.
Uh, I would like to say thank you again to our speakers uh, for providing this insight. This was uh, very helpful and a real guidance for people who are looking to apply. Um, if you're interested in learning more about FSR, our research, our grant programs, and other information that's coming out from us, please do sign up for the physician newsletter uh, that comes out once a month, and it does provide really great information, including other funding opportunities, such as at the NIH. A reminder that the applications are due on February 26th. And to learn more, please visit our website at stop, www.stopsarcoidosis.org. Any questions that you have about the process can be directed to our program manager, Tamara Alakim at Tamara at stopsarcoidosis.org. If you'd like to review again this video, the video will be available on FSR's website um, in the next few days. So you can come back and review any sections that you have interest in looking at. Thank you again for joining us. Have a great afternoon.